uh, this is about the cars themselves, about the, about the vehicles. And of course, it started with horse cars, and uh, you're looking at an early one here. Uh, when, they, when the horse cars started, they were smaller. They grew somewhat later on in response to demand. Um, this is what they call a bobtail. If you, just a minute, I get out my little laser pointer here. Uh, if, if you look at the back, you'll notice that there isn't a platform or steps or anything. Um, what there was, was a door right in the middle of the back and uh, just a set of steps and you walked behind the thing and got in. Now part of the reason for doing that is there was a real incentive to make horse cars as lightweight as possible because horses had rather limited uh, um, uh, energy and so the lighter the horse car, you know, the easier it was for them to pull. Uh, horse cars had a tendency to derail easily, but they were so light that uh, two or three people could just go and put them right back on the track. Can't do that with a streetcar. Um, and so, and when they started out, they only had a, had a one-person crew. Um, that changed later in the, in the 1880s. And so uh, they grew larger in response to demand. Now, if you had looked at the, uh, this, kind of a quick way to do it is just to count the windows. You'll notice there's five windows on that one. This one's got six. Plus, it's got rear platforms. It's just a bigger vehicle. Um, and uh, they went to conductors in the late 1800s. Karen, is this way beyond the era where they put both planks down and a metal strip on top of them? And you're supposed to repeat the question so that those people at home can... Well, I think they heard that one. Okay. Because you're, 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 you're close enough to me. What he's talking about was the very first ones were on what they called strap rail. And strap rail was simply wooden stringers with flat steel on, uh, on top of them, uh, attached to the top. And um, no, they definitely went to regular railroad rail. However, horse car tracks were, uh, were much more lightly built than, uh, than the, uh, they really weren't, uh, weren't heavy enough built for the electric street cars. And when the electric street cars came in, they had to replace all the tracks with something heavier. Okay, uh, in, in St. Paul they were the same gauge, four foot eight and a half inches, which is what we run on, and that's standard railroad gauge. Uh, in Minneapolis, the horse cars were all three foot narrow gauge between the rail, and they all had to be widened. I actually have one photo in the archive where you can see there are three rails in the street, because it was during that, uh, that transition period. It's an era that's hard to imagine with all the horse droppings, and they didn't do anything about it, right? Well, you know, somebody was out there cleaning it up, but uh, it was, but no, there were horse droppings all over the street. It was pretty unsanitary. And th that was, frankly, one of the reasons that they wanted to try to come up with a way to mechanize it. Now, they had both open and closed horse cars. And this, by the way, is, is in front of one of the horse car barns, which I think this was up at around Broadway in Washington, uh, in Minneapolis. Could they um, set, uh, hook the horses up to either end? Uh, yes, the, they, they actually had them set up so they, they'd walk the team around. Okay. Now, on some lines, they had a turntable on the end of the line, and they would just get on the turntable and turn the whole team and the, and the horse car. Okay. In other places, they'd walk them around the other end. Right. Kind of like the ones they have in San Francisco now for the, That's correct. the end of the line for the cable cars. Right, little manual turntable. That's right. Get out and walk it around. That's right. Now, when they went to electrification, remember electrification uh, started in late 1889 and concluded at halfway through 1891. They got rid of all the horses and uh, uh, and the, and the steam ones and converted electricity. And so, when they came up with the the new electric cars, they were really just kind of overgrown versions of the horse cars. Uh, and when they started out. Uh, they had open front platforms. And the assumption, of course, always was, well, if you were a Teamster driving, you know, a team, you were out in the open, so now you got this vehicle, well, you'll just be out in the open. Now, what they didn't anticipate was the wind chill, because now you're going 20 miles an hour oh, okay. or so. And, I mean, look at the, look at the fur coat this guy has yeah. on. Yeah. Um, so, um, and uh, the motorman uh, started to complain, my gosh, it's cold out here. And they actually, in St. Paul, a motorman actually froze to death at the controls. Mm -hmm. You're kidding. Nope. Wow. 
It actually happened, and it caused the state legislature to pass what they called the vestibule law in 1893, where they said you have to enclose the front vestibule to give uh, uh, pro weather protection to the motorman. And uh, the streetcar companies, you know, oh, this is terrible. It's going to put us out of business, you know, because the, it was the panic of 1893 was going on at that same time, which was really kind of a big uh, economic hit. <clears throat> but nonetheless, they did it. And this is what they looked like. And so this particular car was uh, previously built with an open front platform. Well, now here it's enclosed. A car 78, by the way, the way we see it right now is the way it was built. Um, after the vestibule law, they enclosed one of the doors on one side so that they just had a door at each corner. The, well, depending on which way you were doing, you were going, the rear right-hand door was open. Um, and so we've restored it pre-vestibule law. Oh. And then because they had a pretty big investment in horse cars, I mean they had been buying new horse cars up to within a year or so of, of when they did the first electrification. And so they had all these horse cars that were less than five years old. Well, they went and rebuilt a number of them into, uh, um, into uh, electric streetcars. This is one of them. And they actually rebuilt it twice. Um, they rebuilt it first, small. And now if you look at this thing, this thing has eight windows. And so one of the things that happened after the electrification took place, first you had the city growing at a dramatic rate. Second, now you could get a lot. Ridership went way up because you could go more places and faster. And so uh, they were always, oh, trying to come up with a way to haul more people. They were overcrowded. Uh, if you saw some of those cartoons in the last magazine, you know, where uh, they were criticizing the overcrowding, well, that went on for about 20 years. They couldn't, they couldn't keep ahead of the demand. And so the first thing they did is they built some larger streetcars, but they're still these single truckers. And the more you extended these things out, the longer they got compared to the wheelbase, the more unstable they got. And of course, you know, if you go in 78, it looks kind of like this. And these early cars, besides not riding very well with the four-wheel truck, they were also kind of narrow. And so, you know, if you're sitting here across from each other and people going back and forth, you're getting your toes stepped on. And um, this is what they call um, longitudinal seating as opposed to transverse seating which is you know forward facing. Most people don't like this. They don't like the start and the stop feel and so it just wasn't uh, very popular. By the way with the stove like we have in 78 uh, they'd pull the stove out in the summer so they get in one more seat. They'd stick a little seat insert in there. What's the flooring on that? Okay um, the flooring is uh, it's a ribbed floor where um, there, it's raised boards with gaps in between, and the idea was that if you got snow and ice on your shoes, it would drip into there and then melt. And as a matter of fact, you're going to see that same flooring only going this way in car 78. I, I mean in, car, in Winona 10, when the floor goes down. Because it was very common in streetcars to have this raised gap floor so that the... Um, all the ice and snow could drip down and, and melt. Huh. Now, this is out at the, uh, this, as far as I know, is at the end of the Bryant Avenue line, to 46th and Bryant. And I just wanted to show it because uh, here, this is an old horse car body that they're using as a waiting shelter. Now, of course, it would have been sitting up on wheels, but you can see kind of how it compares in size to the first generation <laughs> of streetcars. Um, it's the same idea, but they still were smaller. And this, of course, is a little bitty five-window car. This is one of the early ones. Now, the city ordinances required them to have both open and closed cars. And so they wound up with a summer fleet and a winter fleet. And uh, uh, Twin City Lines wasn't too happy about that because that was really expensive. So they had uh, single truckers. Uh, and um, I'll, I'll, I'll get back, back to that in a little bit. Um, so besides building, rebuilding some of the horse cars as, um, as motor cars, um, they were ready to go as trailers. 
behind the electric cars. That's the one thing they could do is they could haul a trailer. And that was a quick way to double your capacity. And they had each car had a conductor. So the first car had a motorman and a conductor. The second car had a conductor. So for a 50% increase in manpower, you got a doubling of your capacity. The problem with trailers was that first it's they were slower because these motor cars were not that that uh, powerful and now they're hauling the trailer and the couplings were loose and so they bang and, and, and clang together and um, there tended to be a certain number of injuries and derailments because of that slack action um, and so it was kind of a stopgap to get you some capacity <coughs> but it was not popular with anybody however it was a way to use uh, these old horse cars. So again, these trailers were not powered. These were not powered. They're just being dragged along did behind. They, did they hook the brakes up to them? Did they have brakes? No. Uh, um, well, this thing, yeah, yeah, these things had hand brakes on them, okay. but I think they mostly used it just to, you know, like a parking brake. Why did they mandate that they have both summer and winter? Uh... Um, I'm not entirely sure, but that's what they did uh, because uh, everyone had them. Uh, here's, uh, here's a trailer train. Uh, this, by the way, that, that's actually a cable car trailer. You can tell it's a cable car trailer because it has what they call the railroad roof rounded on the end. This is what you call a deck roof right here, like 1300 and 1239 have. Um, and so, but this is what a typical uh, um, train looked like. Now, <coughs> they then invested in some double truck open cars. Um, double truck was the standard on railroad coaches where you got you know two trucks under it and it's a you get a bigger vehicle with more room and it's a much more stable ride and so they started buying in the 1890s double truck open cars as a matter of fact now this picture recognize where this is that, uh, nope this is this is the north end of our line at Lakewood Cemetery this is the Lakewood Cemetery oh. Depot and the thing had just been built this is about 1892 or so and this is actually a real rebuild of one of the motor line coaches. Remember, this was the motor line, the narrow gauge steam powered motor line. Oh, yeah. And uh, they went and they took a bunch of the coaches and rebuilt them into double truck open cars. Now, this is classic for open cars in that, see, there's running boards. There's running boards all the way along here, and you just hung on. Mm -hmm. Well, there was a problem with having running boards. In the horse car era, in the horse car era because it took a lot of energy to stop and start a horse car as opposed to just having to go along. If um, they only stopped horse cars for women, children, the elderly, and the infirm. If you were an able-bodied male, it was assumed that you would swing on and off the car as it went, went along at five or six miles an hour. And that would both save time and save the horse's energy. Well, they didn't change that, uh, that procedure when they started running 20, 25 miles an hour with Laura. And you started having injuries and the company getting sued. And, uh, and it was especially the case with open cars. So uh, what they did is they took off the running boards and cut an aisle down the middle and put steps with gates. And this was actually the predecessor of the gates that you saw you see on the back of 1239. This was called the Minneapolis Gate. And it dramatic, you know, doing this dramatically reduced injuries. Yeah. Wow. And they also, and, and, and they also had to literally change the operating rules so that yes, you stop for everyone. They don't just swing on. <laughs> um, now the open cars lasted, the, um, the single truck open cars were gone by 1905. Um, they actually kept a, a, a small number of these open, of uh, these double truckers, and even put air brakes on them. This is, see this uh, tank here? That's an air brake tank. Before that, they had hand brakes. And, uh, and they ran these things up until about 1910. But, but you hardly ever see a picture of them. Uh, but they were kind of a good crowd swallower. Now, a couple of uh, a little diversions. Uh, in 1890, um, pardon me, 1891 or 92, they, uh, Twin City Rapid Transit purchased the St. Paul and White Bear Railroad, which was a little independent line uh, that 
uh, the streetcar line went out to 7th and Duluth on the east side of St. Paul, and that's where it met this little thing that went up to North St. Paul and Montemidi. And when, these, when this thing electrified, they bought, uh, oh, six or eight, I think it was eight, of these very crude looking early streetcars. And so Twin City Lines uh, absorbed them into the fleet and ran them until about 1905, and uh, this is what they looked like under Twin City Lines. Now, one of the things we'll talk about is, is the trucks. This is a Bemis truck here, which is an early crude truck, um, and probably not sprung very well, uh, small motors. Now, as the 1890s progressed, they're trying to add capacity, and they built three of these. And uh, what it is, is it's two of the single trucker bodies that have been put together to form one longer car. And it had the bowling alley seats, you know, uh, the whole length of this thing. And it was not a success. So they didn't do any more of those. But they're trying to figure out what to do, yeah. Did they run, it says U.S. mail on there? That's they correct. They carried the mail. They actually carried the mail. Uh, they, they had metal, um, metal mailboxes that they would hang on the back of the car and a post office employee would bring them out, hang them on. You could actually drop a letter in one and they ran back and forth uh, uh, between Minneapolis and St. Paul and then in addition to that they carried pouch mail um, on a bunch of different runs all over the city. Huh. As a matter of fact, the very last one was Minneapolis to Hopkins and that lasted until the end of the Hopkins line in 1951. Wow. Um, Along the side here? Oh, uh, that just for safety or? that's safety. That that was just to try to keep somebody from ducking underneath. Who knows why? <laughs> now, in 1892, they went to the American Car Company, which was uh, a commercial car builder, and they ordered 20 of these. And this was sort of the and and they specified the design, and you can see this starts to look like a Twin City streetcar. Um, these also ran on University Avenue and had the U.S. mail. Now, this is on a Bemis power truck, and the power truck, you notice how this center thing is kind of offset? That's how we know that this is a two-motor car. Now, that makes a difference. Our street cars, 1300, 12, uh, uh, 1300 and 265, are four-motor cars. Each axle has a motor geared to it, so you get a total of 200 horsepower, 450 horsepower motors. 1239 is a two-motor car. We've only got one motor, uh, only one axle under each truck is, uh, is powered. Makes a big difference in the speed, power consumption, and all that. So when they were starting, uh, they had a lot of two-motor cars, which were, which were not very, uh, there wasn't a, a lot to get up and go on them. Now these cars lasted until about 1910, 1912, and Twin City Lines took them in and rebuilt them, and this is what they looked like in their final. If you take a look, you see they squared off, they, 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 they completely changed how the windows looked. They put a, uh, modern trucks underneath them. The, uh, the streetcar company was changing out the trucks all the time. So just go back and give you one more look. So it went from this to that. But it's still the same basic car. So anyway, this is before Twin City Lines started building their own. Well, this is the first production car. Twin City Lines finally decided that it was time to build their own streetcars, and they're the only streetcar company that built all of their own streetcars. Nobody else did it. Uh, some others built a fair number of them, but nobody else built them all. And this is inside the 31st Street shops, 31st and Nicollet. And uh, this one, by the way, has the early Bemis truck under it. The first ones had that. Uh, starting in 1905, Twin City Lines, unlike any other streetcar system, began building their own trucks. Nobody else did that. Everyone else, even if they built their own cars, <coughs> they bought trucks from one of the commercial car builders. Building your own trucks was a big deal. Here's another view inside 31st Street Shops, and this is that transition period, or oh, between 1900 and 1905. You can see the new cars being built over here. Here's one of them that was built. And yet here are a couple of the single truckers, and here's one of the old horse cars being still used as a trailer. 1905 was about when they phased out 
all the that's when they phased out the use of trailers. They got enough of the new cars in that they didn't need them anymore. Um, plus, if you think about it, a, tr a trailer train had a crew of three, a motorman and a conductor for each car. Um, one of the new ones had the same capacity as a trailer train with a two-person crew, a conductor and a, and a, and a motorman. Um, now, they kept, they kept uh, about, oh, a dozen of the single truckers around until about 1912, because what they discovered, even though this was a single-end system, you'll notice our cars are single-ended. Uh, they're really only designed to be run in one direction. We back them up, but that wasn't the intent. The, our backup controls were really only used for turning around at a Y on the end of the line or, or backing into the car barn. Um, other systems decided to have double truck cars with full controls on each end, like Winona 10. Uh, and uh, the trade-off was you had to put more controls and electrical on the car, but you didn't have to build turnaround loops and Ys at the end of the line. So this was a single direction car system, but there were always a few places where you needed a double-ended car. There were short shuttle routes, or there were places where there'd be like a sewer project, tear up the street, and you'd have to run a, a, a short shuttle at the end of the line. And so they took, a, they took a dozen or so of these old single truckers and they kept them around until 1912 as just little shuttle cars for those special circumstances. So now, Twin City Lines built the Twin City Lines standard car from 1898, 20 years until 1917. <coughs> During that time, though, the, the streetcar technology evolved and the Twin City Line standard car evolved. Now, this is one from about, oh, 1900 or so. And this has a wood underframe. And the way you can tell it has a wood underframe is you see these truss rods. And it's got a turnbuckle in the middle because the car bodies would sag and you'd tighten up the truss rod to keep the car body from sagging. It's also got tie rods that run through. You see these little uh, uh, things right here? Those are the ends of the tie rods and that was to keep the body pulled together. Now, the, uh, the use of one underframes continued until uh, 1905 and they switched to steel underframes, which is what we have under 265, 1300, and 1239. They're wood from the underframe up, but the, the, uh, the underframe itself is steel. Uh, which not only didn't sag, but also was just much stronger and more stable. Until 1902, these cars were all built with hand brakes. There was a big gooseneck rod, and, uh, and when the motor went to stop it, you'd lean into that, and, um, and you had to really plan ahead, because these things did not stop on a dime. Um, after that, they went to air brakes. And that's where you got the cylinder under the car. You'll hear the compressor pounding under the car. And air brakes had tremendous more stopping power than hand brakes. So that was another one of the evolutions. And then the other thing was they gradually uh, paired excess weight off of it so that the later cars weighed a few thousand pounds less than the earlier cars, which then lowered energy consumption and all. This, by the way, is at the loop at Phelan Park in uh, St. Paul. So the stove there, the heater, is right next to the motor man. Right. Versus 265, where it's a little bit behind now. Right. Well, <clears throat> you have to remember that uh, when the cars were modified for one-man operation, Duluth and Minneapolis did it differently. In Minneapolis, um, well, I have to back up. Um, the heaters were always on the front platform. You can see, you can see the smokestack right. for the heater, and it's right behind him here. Now, it was a pain in the neck to stoke the coal on one of these front platform heaters because you, you had to climb up into this uh, not very easy to climb into door and then get on your hands and knees or bend over and stoke the fire. Plus, like 265, it was a hot water system where there were pipes running the perimeter of the car wall. Well, these car bodies flexed and I, think, I, I haven't seen documentation of it, but I think that they had a lot of leakage out of the pipes. So, uh, what they went to in the 1920s was a forced air system. This is on Twin City Lines. A forced air system where they, they put a, a heater that was suspended under the car here and that you could just walk along the car and you could feed it. 
without having to climb in. And then it fed ductwork that went under and up both sides of the car for forced air to all parts of the car. I don't think they had a blower on it. I think it was just, um, uh, what's the word I want? Con convection, thank you. When Duluth went and rebuilt their cars, they simply kept the heater and the hot water system on the front platform, which is why that's what 265 has today. So the Mormon went from freezing to death in the open <laughs> to almost cooking to death. That's correct. Yeah. To then not, and then when they put in the forced air, they supplemented it with the electric resistance heaters on the front and rear platforms. Mm -hmm. And 1300 was one of about 60 cars that got the electric resistance heaters all through the car and no coal stove at all which I don't understand why they didn't do that on more cars because it's clean and uh, because with the coal stoves there were literally coal bins at the end of every car they'd turn it they'd fire up these heaters in November and the heaters would be keep going continuously until April uh, and and they had to stock coal all over the place whereas with the electric heaters you just flip a switch and they're on I don't know it's not clear to me huh so, <coughs> as the cars were built, this is the same seating configuration as 1239 because you got, you got the front bulkhead up here, and so uh, you got the long peanut row seats in the back. And the reason for that is everybody's getting on and off through the back door, and you got crowding here with people trying to get around each other, which is why you got more aisle room. When they went and rebuilt the cars for a, a one man operation, like 1300, they cut these things in half and put half of them up in the front and half in the back because you have people coming to the front door so you want that extra space in the front and then they moved all the uh, all the forward facing seats just back partially so it's all the same seats but they reconfigured them do they have screens and windows um they actually what they did is they put the screens on the left hand side and um, technically we should be running with those but we just don't bother and that was because uh, that was where you got you could uh, reach out and either hit an overhead wire pole or another car, oh. another street car that was going by. It was to prevent arm injuries. Okay. So they were only put on the left-hand side. Um, what they did do in the wintertime is they hung storm windows on the outside, on both sides, and in which case then they'd take these uh, screens down. That's the first picture I've seen that <coughs> illustrated. Yeah. You've well, talked about it before. <coughs> Now, about 1900, they, they had built a couple of batches of the new cars, and they said, we need a few that are, are smaller for the lighter lines. And so this is what they called the C-Class. And they built about 30 of these. And um, they, they were like 35 foot instead of 40 foot long. And they just put them out on the lighter lines. And this has a two-motor uh, Bemis truck on it when they built it. And now here's one a few years later. And this has got a Brill truck under it, which is a much better commercial truck with twice as much power. Um, now what I'm showing here is the progression of the rear gates. Here's one of the earliest cars and it has a single rear gate. Well that wasn't easy, there were people you know trying to get on and off at the same time so they went to the double rear gates and most of ours including 1239 and 1300 were built with a double rear, uh, a double stream rear gates. But then um, even that was causing congestion. Let's see if I can get to it here. We had a little trouble with this one picture. And I, okay, oh, well, we, I was going to put in a picture of them with triple stream rear gates, which is I think what we have on 1239 now. We definitely have it on 1300, where there, there were three sets of gates. So when they built the Lake Minnetonka line, they experimented with double-decker cars and they, they built uh, three of them. Uh, the first one uh, was 1095 here and this was, uh, this was actually a wood frame car. I, I'm almost sneezing but I'm not quite. Um, and, and it had this open upper roof. It had a stairway in the front to get to the upper deck and then you, everybody else uh, entered through the rear. And they actually put this thing in service in 1905-06 and uh, it would make a round trip every two hours on the Lake Minnetonka line, and they advertised it. Now, <clears throat> they, they, it really wasn't successful, and the, I think the reason it wasn't successful 
was that it was open air and if it rained, uh, you were probably going to get wet. Uh, the second thing is, I think there might have been a problem with it being top heavy, you know, or people viewing it as top heavy. Now they went ahead and they built one more. They built 1145, which was a steel underframe car, and, uh, and they enclosed it much more. And these decks, by the way, were designed to be taken off so you could use the car in the winter without the deck on. But this series of cars, they had in mind to build, oh, I think it was 50 or about 50 of these things. And these were built with extra um, bracing, extra structure, four upper decks, but they only put, uh, had the one. And this is the famous picture in downtown Excelsior showing this car. There's a famous picture that everyone sees, and it's this car. But, uh, so they built these cars, but they did not uh, put the decks on them. And they were, the, they were the heaviest cars that they had. They were something like 60,000 pounds without the upper deck. The regular cars were about 40, 47,000 pounds. Now this, by the way, is at the shops at 31st Street. And see this thing right over here? I've published this picture a couple of times. This is Abraham Lincoln's funeral car. Thomas Lowry was a huge devotee of Abraham Lincoln. And uh, when, uh, when the funeral car became available, in 1905, Lowry bought it, and it wasn't in good shape, and it needed restoration, so he took it over to the shops at 31st and Nicollet, and uh, the shop guys restored it. And then they put it up in Columbia Heights on display, and then it burned in 1911, which was a big tragedy. But it just amazes me. When I found this picture, first I was, I was excited to see a picture of this double-decker, because there hardly are any. And then I looked in the corner, it's like, ah, I know what that is. Uh, and, and I... I I couldn't believe that I'd actually found a picture of that car. Huh. So, um, the kind of the ultimate <coughs> version of the Twin City streetcar were the high-speed suburban cars. And these are the ones that ran out to Excelsior and to Stillwater. And it's a standard Twin City car, but it's got 75 horsepower motors, not 60 horsepower. By the way, I should digress for a moment and say, up until about 1905, they built them with 40 horse motors. So you had 440 horses, you had 160 uh, horsepower total. Afterwards, what 265, I'm sorry, what 265 and 1300 have are 50 horse motors. So those are 200 versus 160. And for as long as the 160 ones were around, they were referred to as slow cars and the 50, the 200 horsepower were called fast cars because it did make a difference. Well, these had 75 horse motors uh, and taller gearing and the cow catcher instead of the fender because they were running out in the country. These are marker lights to indicate what kind of a train it was. In the city they ran as streetcars where yes each streetcar had a schedule but there was no coordination between them. The, you know, the, 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 the guy ran on line of sight and it was kind of informal. As soon as you got outside of the city, they went to railroad practice where there was a full timetable, every train had a number, and trains could run in sections, which on summer Sundays they did. There might be five cars running as sections of this train. The cars were physically separated, running about a minute apart behind each other, and this right here had colored glass in it that would indicate if there were additional sections or if it was a special movement or something. There were a series of codes in there. Um, and, and so that once uh, they ran on the Minnetonka line, they were referred to as trains, not streetcars, formerly by the company. So anyway, there were about 40, I think 41 of these, some of which were built as, uh, as high-speed cars, some of which were modified from regular streetcars. Inside they had no peanut row side seats. All the seats faced forward. And, uh, and so, and once again they, uh, they hit 60 after they left the city. Once they got west of France Avenue that's when they went 60. Now this is the one that they designed for the Lake Minnetonka line and never built. And uh, it's, it's designed to run trains. It's got couplers on it. It's got uh, train doors so that you could walk between cars. It's got a toilet. Um, and it's about eight feet longer than the standard car.
And they thought about putting these in and they just never got around to it. <clears throat> now, uh, 1912 came along and they retired all those little single truckers that, were, that they had set up as double enders for little short shuttles. And they took a similar number of these uh, C-class shorter cars and they double ended them. See how this has got a pole in the front and a pole in the back? Because they still needed. And, and all the way up to the end of service, they still had uh, a couple of double enders in the fleet that they could use for these special situations. And here you can really see the stove on the front platform. Now, you got to uh, uh, 1911, 1912, 1913, that period, and technology was moving on. And two things were happening. First, you were, so you were getting the first construction of all steel streetcars. Not, you know, not steel in the underframe and the wood above, but all steel. The second thing was you got the development of lightweight streetcars. Motors got smaller and more, and, and more powerful, and if you designed a lighter weight streetcar, well, for one thing, because the, the streetcar company could not raise the fare. It's, it had been a nickel since the 1870s. It was still a nickel. And uh, they were looking for ways to reduce their costs. So one of the first ways, they, the things they wanted to do was to reduce power consumption. Well, if you built a lighter weight car and reduced your power consumption, you could then run it with smaller motors, smaller wheels, which would then lower the car so it was easier to get on and off, fewer steps to climb. And, um, and so all across the country, you started to see uh, lightweight cars built. <coughs> in, in 1916, Twin City Lines, because they did everything themselves, they went and they designed their, their, their first lightweight train with a separate truck that was much lighter weight uh, on, on more or less a conventional car body above it. And they decided, uh, and plus they were having to deal with even more and more pa patronage, and so they said, let's make a two-car train. Um, at the same time, they tried it a version with the standard cars, where they took one of the latest standard cars, and then they took one of the older wood-framed standard cars and turned them into trailers. And so it was a competition between, do we build the lightweights or do we build these? And they decided to build these. And they built, uh, I think, 20 of these trains. Um, and they didn't go back to lightweight design. That was for another, uh, another seven years until 1923. Is that the building in the background that's downtown? No. Uh, this is the Motor Line Roundhouse at, uh, at 31st and Nicollet. And they, they retained that <coughs> as a shop building until about 1912 when they tore it down, when they put in the, the new version of the, of the uh, streetcar barn there. It was this configuration where I thought they might hook up the brakes in the back in the trailer car. Um, yes, I'm sure they probably had it. I'm sure they had an airline for brakes yeah, to it. I can't imagine that they wouldn't have. But it was... Okay, so then 1923, they built another prototype lightweight train. Uh, 2002, 2003, and these two cars, they were both powered, but they were run off of this one. Later they separated them so that they could run as individual cars. And these actually became the trademark. They actually uh, worked it into the trademark. If you look at some of the, uh, at, at, uh, some of the ads that I've been running in the magazine, I had these two, two Christmas shopping ads. If you look at the bottom, you'll see a drawing of these two cars on the bottom. So for, through the 1920s, this kind of represented the modern thing. So that was 1923, and then they didn't do anything else for about uh, uh, two years with lightweights. But then in 1925, they really started to get into lightweights seriously. And uh, they built these four cars for the Stillwater local line. Stillwater had uh, three little local lines that ran in Stillwater, Oak Park Heights, and Bayport. And, uh, and so that using the lightweight technology, uh, they built these little guys. And they ran out there until 1932, and then they ran in the rest of the system, various things, until about 1950. Um, and I didn't bother to put it in here. I, you may recall I did an issue of Twin City Lines that was all on the lightweights. And a company started up called the Lightweight Noiseless Electric Streetcar Company. 
And what they did is they hired Twin City Lines to build streetcars for other systems using these lightweight patents. And uh, they built about, oh, 30, 35 cars for other systems, and then they went out of business. But uh, they did the, uh, Twin City Lines built it for them at Snelly Shops. They built cars for Nashville, Chattanooga, Evansville, and Chicago. And Duluth, I might add. Okay, so then finally in 1925, uh, they built one last prototype train of lightweights. Uh, these cars were designed that they could run individually or together. And then beginning in 1927, they went and built 20 more to, a, to the standard design. And these things lasted until the end of service. Now, they, uh, they weren't favored by the motorman in the operating department because they were a little bit slow and <clears throat> uh, they had a tendency to spin their wheels in acceleration and the brakes had a tendency to grab. They used an automotive type drum brake. And um, so it was a little bit of a flawed design, but nonetheless, the, this was... Now, what Twin City Lines did not do is until the PCC cars arrived in, after, after World War II, they never owned a steel body car. Matter of fact, the cars they were building up through 1917, after about 1913, those cars were obsolete because they were still wood. <coughs> now, this is inside one of the lightweights. And the motorman actually has a comfortable chair, which he, he didn't have before. And they should still use the rattan, the wicker, but they had armrests on them. <coughs> so Twin City Lines started building their own trucks in 1905. Um, when they went and rebuilt the cars for uh, what they called one two-man operation starting in 1930, that was when they were getting rid of conductors and they wanted the option to have a conductor on or to run it with just the motorman. And uh, when they started rebuilding the cars to do that, they, they built all new trucks for them with roller bearings. You can see this round here, that's a roller bearing. And this is, these are the trucks that are under 1300 that are getting rebuilt now. And so 1300 was built in 1908, but its trucks were built in 1930. It was an upgrade. And, and it was a new generation of motors that were more efficient. Now, this is the one that I am told the Minnesota Rail Fans Association, which is the ones who got 1300 and started our museum, this was the car I'm told they wanted to get and they couldn't. Uh, this is car 1136, and it was the last car in the system to uh, be in its original configuration with double stream gates and, uh, and the motorman's enclosed compartment. And the, the reason it survived was this car was specially outfitted to be used as a state fair operations office. And it would sit along University Avenue by Snelling Station all year long. And then for the state fair, they'd run it up to the fairgrounds. It was equipped with desks and telephones for the supervisor so they could sit in there and they could run the state fair operation. And, um, and I'm told that they tried to get it and they couldn't. <coughs> I wish. Um, by the way, a little something to note. Um, when the streetcars, uh, when Twin City Lines started building their own cars in 1898, that's when the yellow color scheme started. Only the difference was that there was a gold leaf pinstriping that went all around here and the letters were outlined in gold. And the door was yellow outlined in gold with little, uh, little uh, yellow and green, gold and green accents. Um, Bill, when Bill Graham went and painted 1239, he has, uh, the color scheme changed. The gold leaf went away in 1920. And the, after that it was, and the, and the letters went to green. And the door went to solid green. Bill Graham didn't like the solid green door. He and I have talked about this. And so he painted the door in the pre-1920s colors, but the rest of the car is in the post-1920s colors. And so he wants to now repaint 1239. And I said, well, Bill, you got to do one or the other. You either got to put the gold leaf on here and change the numbers, or you got to paint the door green. He wants to go and put the gold leaf back on. <laughs> so it'll be pre-1920 in its appearance. Um, 
And the only problem with that was then the triple stream rear gates are incorrect, but there's nothing we can do about that. They should be double stream rear gates. Ah, nit, nitpicky. <clears throat> so what I want to show you here is how the cars evolved through three rebuildings. This is how the front platform was originally configured. You had a bulkhead all the way across with an access door for the motorman, and you had that motorman door with the little stirrup step. Just this is this is this is more or less what 1239 looks like. Uh, but the controller wasn't over here. The controller was right in the middle. And as a matter of fact, this window would drop down into the sash. You could open it up completely. And the motorman seat was here, and then you had the big heater, platform heater. Now, in 1921, probably about 1919, they went to pay-as-you-enter fare collection. Prior to pay-as-you-enter, um, everybody would come piling on the rear door, go in and sit down, and then the conductor would walk around, collect their fares by hand. There were no fare boxes. Put the fares in an envelope for that trip. Put the envelope in one of his many pockets and then account for it at the end of the day. Now, there were a lot of problems with that. First, you could have 30 people get on at a big stop downtown, and how do you figure out which ones have paid and which ones haven't? You might wind up asking somebody to pay who already had. Uh, and there was ample opportunity for conductors to go and steal money. So they put in the fare registers in the back. 1300 has this big mechanical fare register hanging up on a pole. And they were required to go and ring up the fares, but they were still collecting them by hand. Pay as you enter was when they created the fare box. And they hung the fare box on a pole in the back. And you had to get on and put your fare in the box, not handed to the conductor, before you sat down. Pay as you enter. And that solved a lot of these problems. Um, it had some drawbacks. You couldn't move a streetcar down the line quite as quick as because before you'd put the crowd on and then you could get moving while you're collecting your fares. Now you'd fill up the back platform before you could get moving. But <clears throat> it wasn't quite as efficient, but nonetheless it cut down on the fraud. The problem was that you still had everybody trying to get in and out the back door and you had all this congestion. So they did what they probably should have done originally which is they put a front exit door in. So now you could get on the back, walk through the car, get off the back, because otherwise you'd have crowds of people standing here and nobody sitting in the front seats. You know, it was very inefficient. So th this is how that changed the platform. What they, uh, to do that, to create the front exit door, they removed the motorman's door, they took the bulkhead and for the motorman's compartment and put it over here with a new door, they moved the controller over to the left instead of being in the center, and, uh, and they took the heater out and created those underfloor heaters that were not in the body of the car. So they did a whole bunch, like 500, this to about 500 cars in the 1920s. Then came the final, starting in about 1930, 2930, where they went and configured the cars as 1300 is configured for operation either by a motorman alone or a motorman working with a conductor, which they called a one-man, two-man car. And to do that, no more hand-operated wire gates. Instead, you got air-operated doors front and rear that the motorman can control. And they put a sign in the front window. If, if there was motorman only, it would say, get on in the front. If they were running with a conductor, it would say, get on in the back and people could get on or off either door. And that caused the front platform. Here you got the great big doors. You've basically taken the bulkhead and gotten rid of most of it. <coughs> and uh, once again, the, uh, you know, the heater's already gone. So this is how these cars got rebuilt as, as they went through because uh, their needs changed. <clears throat> now, you, you may have seen some with the steel sheathing on the side. That's something they started doing in the late 1930s, where they just got tired of replacing all the wood wainscoting when it would rot out, so they put steel sheathing across it. And streamlining was the deal back then, so they went and they tapered it in the front so it would come down to the top, flush to the top of the bumper. So it's, it's kind of angled in the front. But they're just the same cars as ever, it's just that they're covered with steel sheathing. 
So then in 1945, they decided they wanted to try one of these new modern PCC cars. PCC cars have been around since about 36. Well, what they did is they, uh, they diverted one car that was headed to Pittsburgh uh, to the Twin Cities. And this is that car. It's car 299. And if you look at it, you'll notice that it's different in a number of details from our car 322. Um, it doesn't have the, the small standee windows above. It's got a flatter windshield. Uh, more of a sloping back end. And the other thing is its internal systems. This is what they call an air electric. It's got air brakes, air doors, etc. Um, 322 is an all electric, which was one, something they did post World War II, where everything on that car, the braking systems, uh, doors, and everything are all electric. There's no, there's no compressor under there going thunk, 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 thunk. And they, so they really they brought in 299, they really liked it. It stayed until the end of service. They sold it to Mexico City. This is the interior. And because it was built during World War II, it doesn't have the stainless steel poles. It has painted metal poles. And, and it has Pittsburgh's configuration with side seating up in the front of the car. And it's set up here with a conductor station uh, to board in the rear. It ran in Pittsburgh colors, I read, too? It ran in Pittsburgh colors for a, a little while. And I, we've actually got a couple, three pictures of it in Pittsburgh colors. And then, of course, after that, they said, we like them, and we're going to buy uh, 140. And uh, this is what they, so they have the, sta the standing windows up here. And it's, it's the different body style. And there's about 20 of these still around now. There's 11 of them. They're out in San Francisco. They've been completely re overhauled in the last year. And then the very last picture I've got these ones were originally built with a conductor station. They were designed with conductors because they were built for University Avenue. So this is in the middle. He's, right, he's opposite that middle door with a fare box. And uh, then after about two years, they said, no, nah, we don't need conductors anymore. And so they just put a regular seat in here and took the fare box out. So that's the show, folks, on, on cars. Now you know more than you wanted to know.